You probably know that ever since it was first performed in the 1970s, George Carlin's seven words you can never say on TV routine has been considered a stand-up comedy masterpiece. Wouldn't you think it'd be normal if they didn't want you to say something to tell you what it is? But you might not know that Carlin's bit kicked off a legal battle that is still taught in law schools to this very day. Today, we're going to take a look at how George Carlin's seven dirty words routine caused a landmark Supreme Court decision. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, please leave a comment and let us know what other pop culture taboo related topics you would like to hear about. Okay? Shit, pit, fuck, cock, cock, your mother, and tits. Let's do this. The 1950s and early 1960s were relatively conservative times in America, even for comedians. Lenny Bruce, however, was a notable exception. As one of the first comics of the era to do obviously taboo material, Bruce was a hit in many quarters. However, he remained a controversial figure to much of the country, and he was arrested for public obscenity five times between 1961 and 1964. One of those arrests would change the course of a young George Carlin's career. Carlin originally presented himself with a wholesome, clean-cut image and a soft, family-friendly act. However, in 1962, Carlin was arrested alongside Lenny Bruce. While Carlin himself was only detained for not carrying an ID, the intrusive experience and the effect it had on Bruce's career left an impression. Years later, Carlin would also recall feeling like a traitor who was entertaining the fathers and mothers of the people he actually sympathized and associated with. Subsequently, he began to grow out his hair and beard, and his comedy became edgier and more socially conscious. He resolved to push boundaries, just like Lenny Bruce. George Carlin's famous seven words you can never say on television routine was first developed and recorded in 1972. And here's the list of words your dad and I don't ever want to hear you say. Cursing was highly taboo and the bit examined how it was possible simple words could be so harmful that audiences had to be protected from hearing them. Boy, that's gonna save me an ass kicking or two. <laughs> Those words, <laughs> pit, f c c sucker, mother and tits. It was an instant success. Crowds loved to hear Carlin do the routine and he would continue to refine and perform it for decades to come. In July of 1972, Carlin performed at Milwaukee's Summerfest. One of the routines he performed there was the Seven Words monologue, and after completing it, he was arrested for obscenity. Carlin would eventually beat the charges in court. With a judge ruling, his language was indecent, but not illegal. In a masterful act of trolling, Carlin would temporarily rename the bit the Milwaukee Seven. He would later find it funny that he was hassled over saying the seven words when his whole intention in the first place was to free people from being hassled over saying the words. They're just the words we can't say all the time. While the trouble over the seven words in Milwaukee may have passed, that wasn't the end of it. In 1973, John H. Douglas, a self-appointed media watchdog, heard the routine on the radio while he was driving his son home after visiting colleges. The station was WBAI, an affiliate of Pacifica Radio, and they had actually been airing the uncensored routine as part of an intellectual discussion about language taboos. Backed by his organization, Morality and Media, Douglas filed a complaint with the FCC and asked that Pacifica lose its license to broadcast. The FCC's investigation of the incident would last months. Finally, in 1975, Douglas's complaint was upheld and Pacifica was issued a warning. Of particular concern to the commission was that the broadcast went out at 2 p.m., a time they believed many children would be listening. No sanctions or fines were imposed in the end, but the commission warned Pacifica that future complaints could potentially lead to the cancellation of their license. Pacifica, as you might imagine, wasn't happy having a threat like that hanging over their corporate head, so they sued the FCC in federal court. The case, known as Federal Communications Commission versus Pacifica Foundation, was initially decided by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. In a two-to-one vote, the court ruled the FCC did not have the power to order Pacifica to stop broadcasting the seven words routine. One of the judge's opinions stated that the time of the broadcast was irrelevant. That's irrelevant. Ultimately, the FCC's mandate was found to be unconstitutionally vague and overbroad. Despite the opinion of the court, the FCC maintained that it was their legal duty to stop inappropriate bits like Carlin's seven words from going out over the airwaves. 
They appealed, and the case went before the Supreme Court of the United States. The issue before both the district and Supreme Court was about how to define the difference between indecency and obscenity, and whether the FCC had the power to censor either. Justice John Paul Stevens looked for guidance in a court decision from 1926, which discussed the idea that indecency may be a right thing in a wrong place, like a pig in the parlor instead of the barnyard. In the case of the seven words, he believed that being accessible to children through broadcast media made it a public nuisance and therefore within the FCC's power to censor. In their own defense, Pacifica argued that the definitions proposed by the FCC were wildly overbroad and would prevent uncensored broadcast of great works of classical and contemporary literature, including even passages from the Bible. Surely the justices wouldn't allow such an absurdity, would they? In 1978, by a vote of 5 to 4, the Supreme Court held that the FCC did have a limited power to regulate the content of broadcast media. It further held that the seven words routine was well within those limits and the FCC was entitled to act. The majority opinion discussed how children listening would have no warning about the content of the broadcast, and the easy access to that broadcast meant that the First Amendment protection would be limited. The dissent called the majority misguided and pointed out that the decision could prevent revered works of art and literature from being broadcast merely because they contained a few four-letter words. Nonetheless, the ruling remains law today. The Supreme Court's decision in FCC versus Pacifica was controversial when it was made and remains so today. Prominent First Amendment attorney Floyd Abrams called the decision wrong-headed, and during a similar case in 2012, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg argued that the opinion was wrong when it was issued. She asked the rest of the court to reconsider the Pacifica case, pointing out that time and technology had altered the media landscape so much that the original ruling was untenable anyway. Despite the fact that Carlin's seven words routine was the spark that ignited the case of FCC versus Pacifica, George himself wasn't a party to the litigation and had no stake in the case. In fact, he had no participation at all. He wasn't even called to testify on behalf of Pacifica. Legally speaking, the FCC wasn't after Carlin and generally had no objections to his material. Their wrath was aimed solely at Pacifica for playing the seven words routine during daytime hours. Same for the original plaintiff, John Douglas, who went on record saying he had no objections to the seven words routine for private use. While Carlin disagreed with the Supreme Court's decision, he didn't take it too hard. In fact, he actually found the whole thing pretty amusing. Decades later, he would reflect on the fact that the case was still being taught in law schools and say that he took a perverse pride in being a footnote to the judicial history of the United States. So that's what I love is that gotcha moment when you catch the culture with its pants down. Media watchdog John H. Douglas, for his part, would insist that he was after Pacifica, not Carlin. He even admitted that he laughed out loud at the seven words bit when he heard it. Pacifica and the seven words may have lost the legal battle, but they won the cultural war. The legal fallout from the bit made the routine a high-profile symbol in the struggle to loosen taboos about so-called naughty words and bring an end to the kind of legal persecution that destroyed Carlin's idol, Lenny Bruce. In 2011, a study found that 47% of Facebook profiles contained profanity, and between 2005 and 2010, the use of such language on television increased a whopping 69%. Today, television offers incredibly explicit forms of entertainment. Should I tell you when I plan to take a sh tomorrow, would that be none of your f***ing business? Streaming internet services like Netflix are even less regulated. Oh, These realities mean that while broadcast TV and radio still face strict FCC oversight, such regulatory schemes are rapidly becoming pointless. On June 22, 2008, George Carlin died of heart failure at St. John's Hospital Center in Santa Monica, California. His obituary in the New York Times called him an heir of Lenny Bruce, who gave voice to an indignant counterculture and assaulted the barricades of censorship on behalf of a generation of comics that followed him. It also specifically cited the seven words you can never say on television routine and called it one of the many ways he took aim at what he thought of as the palliating and obfuscating agents of American life. Politicians, advertisements, religion, the media, and conventional thinking of all stripes. 
Cursing, cussing, swearing. All I could think of was shit, fuck, motherfucking tits, man. Harlan was so ahead of his time that even a decade after his death, his comedy still held up. In 2017, Rolling Stone magazine called him an MIT-level linguist, a First Amendment activist, and the undisputed champion gadfly of stand-up. They named him the second-best stand-up comic of all time, behind only Richard Pryor, a man who considered Carlin one of his biggest influences. And he wasn't the only one. Some of the comics that claim Carlin as an influence include Chris Rock, Jon Stewart, Bill Burr, and Bill Hicks. So what do you think? Are you a fan of Mr. Carlin? Speak up, you silly motherfucker. Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our weird history.